about um, user interfaces. But try catches will become especially important when we talk about user interfaces. Because you know when you put uh, a user interface in front of a user, it's kind of like all bets are off, right? In our test classes, we were very careful to make sure that we gave good data. So if something was a number, we set a variable to an integer, and it had to be an integer. Otherwise, it wouldn't compile. But if we're accepting that value from a screen, we don't know what the person's going to type in on the other end. And we might try to process it as an integer, and, and it might blow up. So try catch is a way of, of handling errors, and, and a, a certain kind of error, that is. And that's what's called a runtime error. <clears throat> and a runtime error is when um, something happens while you're actually running the program. All right? Something that you can recover from and tell the user what to do, especially. Like user input's a classic example of that, because um, you can recover from that. If someone types in like a word where they're expected to type in a number, you can recover from that. You, you know, it doesn't require the program crashing. You can tell them, hey, enter a number, all right, and then do that. Um, we could have used try catches, and we could like, go back and retrofit some of our old applications with try catches uh, for things like the category, uh, the residency category of, uh, of, of, of students. You know, there's only three legitimate answers um, in county, out of county, and out of state, or size of a pizza. All right, so it can only be small, medium, and large. That could actually be handled a couple different ways, but one way that it could be handled is via a, um, a um, try-catch, where you, if you set it to something that isn't legal, you can bounce it out. Likewise, you could set exceptions in, like, say, the, the course object that you created, the course class that you created, that if a course was said to have more than whatever the maximum number of credit hours are, I don't know if I've ever seen a, a course over five credit hours, let's say, you could, you could bounce it out and you could say, hey, that's not legal. Or if a course had negative credit hours, even worse, right? It would be a valid integer, but if people that took that course successfully it would be farther away from graduating than they were when they started, which, which wouldn't, be, wouldn't be a good idea, all right? So um, there's a number of places we could do these exceptions, even not relating to a user interface. But again, they'll become very important when we get into user interfaces. Um, things that are unpredictable are, are likely candidates for that. And user interfaces are definitely that. The other thing that we don't really talk about in this class, but has implications um, if you were to go on and, and do some more advanced Java programming, is database interactivity. Because you never know what's going on on the other end with the database that you connect to it. It could be that the database server has crashed or whatever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, we're going to look at a runtime error, and then we're going to look at how we could use a try-catch to do it, and then we'll look at another example. So let me download these. Let me, okay, I'm going to leave this open and we'll download the first example. And the first example, if I remember right, it's been a while since I wrote these, um, is an example where there's no try catch at all. First of all, let's look at this and let's understand what's going to happen. I made a class with just a main in it. 
and I create an array list. What does an array list contain? Well, it contains one of two things. It either contains objects, all right, or it contains a specific kind of object that you've defined is going to put into it. So, for example, in this declaration of an array list, I simply say I have an array list. That means I can literally put any object into that array. Array list, that is. So I could put anything. Anything that we've done so far this semester. I could put a pizza in there. I could put a student in there. I could, could put a course in there. Again, don't think about the practicality of this example. This example is just to show you the mechanics of how to create a try-catch. All right? So, I add two objects to my, I'm going to add two objects, well, I'll start out adding one object to it. And this is sort of a side quest for you video game fans, all right, about boxing and unboxing, all right. Notice I have two things, int and integer. What's different between those two things? Just the letters. What's the difference between the word int and the word integer in terms of the letters? One's capitalized. Right, so that's a hint as to what the difference is. What does the difference, what then does the difference, what do you think the difference is between integer and int? Integer is a class, all right? Int is a primitive. So, why do we need an integer class if we got an int primitive? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Sometimes you need an object, for example, when putting into an array list. Array lists don't take primitives. Array lists only take objects. So therefore, everything we put in an array list has to be an object. So, and there's other opportunities too. There's other, there's other instances where you need an object that represents an integer as opposed to a primitive. Notice what I can do. I declare int i, like I always have. I declare integer i i. I set integer, or I set the int version of i equal to 3, and then I say i i equals i. That, that looks a lot different than what we've done with classes in the past, right? Because in the past we would say something like integer i i equals new integer, uh, integer set value equals such and such and so on. We would use dot notation to get the properties. Here we're treating that ii just like it was a primitive. So in other words, the, the, the instructions would be identical even if I declared ii is an int. All right? That's what's known as boxing. It sort of lets you get away with best of both worlds. In other words, I can, uh, an integer object, I can treat more or less like a primitive. And it will interpret like a primitive int. And there's, there's other boxing too. There's, there's, um, there's doubles and booleans that are objects and so on. So for every primitive, there's a class version of it. And the idea of boxing is that it will treat it like it's a regular integer. All right? Now, there's a couple implications about that. If I have two integers, not ints, and I compare them, it's going to do like it does with every object and see if they're pointing to the same, not that they're the same value. All right? Um, so I could have two integer objects both having a value of 5, and the program will say that they're not equal because they're pointing to two different objects that have a value of 5. Just like I have, uh, I could have two pizzas that were pepperoni, a uh, small 
thin crust with pepperoni and the comparison would tell me they're not equal because they're not pointing at the exact same pizza. All right? But the idea of boxing is that I can pretty much use an integer wherever I use an int and it behaves the same way. Um, there are those that would say this is sort of a compromise of the object-oriented integrity of the Java language, but it does make things go a little simpler. So like it or not like it, this is just the way it is. It's useful in this case because I can use this to demonstrate a try-catch block. So what I'm doing is I'm, what I do initially is I create an int uh, um, primitive, an integer object, I set the int primitive to 3, I set the integer object equal to the int primitive, forget about this for now, I add that object to my array list, I then loop through the array list and square each element on the array list and display the answer. And again, because of boxing and unboxing, this is correct. This will work. I can treat it just like it's a primitive. All right, I can say ii equals ii times ii, and it will work. So it's the standard logic that we've had so far. And this will work, and it will tell me that that um, the value is 9. So let's go and compile this and run it. And we should simply get that the value is 9. squared equals 9. One thing I didn't point out is when we pull that first object, and this is, this is a thing that's going to give us grief in a minute here, all right, I cast it as an integer. I tell it, hey, I've, I know that everything I've put in this array list is an integer, so therefore I can cast it as an integer. And it will show me the output. This again is known as casting. Because this part here returns an object. What kind of object does it return? We don't know. All right? We don't know because an array list, unless you specify the kind of object that you want to force the array list to contain, an array list can contain any kind of object. That's why in like some of the other examples we've done this, array list pizza. So we know that the array list is only going to contain pizza objects. But we didn't do that in this case. We just said, hey, I got an array list. I can put any object in this. But because I got inside information, I know everything I put in here is an integer, so I know this statement's going to be okay to cast that object as an integer. The compiler tried to warn us that this is a bad idea. Java uses unchecked or unsafe operations. What's unsafe about it? Well, what if we don't put an integer in the array list? What if we do this? What if I say, I'm going to create a string. String's an object, right? Capital S means that as a class. So capital S, string e, uh, S equals something. That's sort of like unboxing and unboxing, right? We're using it like it a primitive, but it's really an object. And then I'm going to add 
the integer, and I'm going to add the string. Well, what's going to happen when we loop through this? Well, it's going to be able to do the first one just fine, right? When it hits the second one, though, this statement's going to fail because I can't change the word high into an integer. Just can't do it. Can't cast it into an integer. So it's going to blow up. It's going to blow up with a runtime error. Not a compile error. We got a compile warning saying something like this might happen, but it trusted that we knew what we were doing. Well, we've proved that we don't know what we're doing by doing this, right? So, therefore, we're going to get a runtime error because it's going to encounter a situation it can't possibly do. Again, we get the warning. Then I run that. Did the first one, it got an exception and blew up. And what it's telling me is I can't make an integer out of a string. It is called a class, it's a tongue twister is what it's called, a class cast exception. What that's saying is it can't take a string and, and, and put it into an integer. Now, could you imagine, and again, here's where you have to use your imagination, right? Because no one's writing programs like this. But let's say we had a whole array list of stuff we had to process. Let's say that array, there was an array list of orders. And somehow something about one of the orders was wrong, where there was an exception. All right? We don't want it blowing up when it hits the first exception. What would we want to do? Well, we'd want to probably write to some error report saying there was a problem with this order. But we'd want it to process the rest of the orders, I would think. All right? We wouldn't want to stop production on a thousand orders because the second order had a problem in it. That wouldn't make sense. So therefore, it would be nice if we could acknowledge that an error happened and do something about it without causing the program to crash. All right? So this is a runtime error. It causes the program to crash. Now, let's comment that back out, and let's add a null object to the array list. All right. Notice we've got an exception, right? Because it can't take a null and turn it into an integer. Just can't do it. But notice that it got a different kind of exception. Again, when you hear exception, think error. It got a different kind of error. In this case, it got a class cast exception, whereas I can't take a string and turn it into an integer. In this case, I got a null pointer exception. And this is a real common exception in, in Java programming, specifically Java programs that weren't written or tested too thoroughly. All right? where you have something that you think contains an object, but you find out it really doesn't. And that's effectively what putting a null in there is. I'm putting a, you know, a, a no object out there, an empty object, a pizza that has a, a pizza object that has not been initialized or something like that. All right. So in both cases, if we put in a string, or if we put in a null, we get an error. However, we get told what kind of error it is. So we could treat those errors differently. All right? And that's the important thing about Java exception handling, is we can treat errors to the level that we want to treat them. In other words, we could treat all errors the same and maybe output to a report that this happened. Or we could do different things in the case of one error or different things in the case of another error. All right? We can, we can fine-tune how, um, how do I want to say this? We can fine-tune how um, specific we want to get in our error handling. Either we can do something for every error, or we can do something for specific errors. So, does everyone understand the problem of why these things crashed? All right? 
that's really the, the, the main thing that I want to get out of this part of the exercise. All right, so then, let me delete this guy. And let me pull down part two of the example. All right, here is Oh, here we go. Here's this example with a try catch uh, added to it. All right, so let's navigate in there. Okay, notice what we did. First part of this is the same. All right, we have our int and integer. We add the integer, we create our string with high. We add the integer, we add the string to the array list. So we got two things in the array list. I now have inside of my loop, though, let me do a little better job of indenting this. a try catch block. So do you put a try catch block around everything in your program? Not necessarily. There's some things that are safe. But this is something definitely that I know is unsafe. Right? So I put my lines of code that I know are unsafe in a try block. So try It's going to try these statements. If everything works OK, great. It'll go and execute them. So if, I, if everything behaves and I, if I have an integer in there, all right, um, then those statements will execute and I'll get my output. However, if there's a problem, I can catch and handle certain exceptions. All right. So what am I catching? I'm catching for the class cast exception. What is the class cast exception? That was the exception I get with the string. So if one of those gets thrown, and that's the terminology. When an error happens, an exception is thrown. This guy catches it. And if it's a class cast exception, then this code executes. If it's not, but it's some other kind of exception, then this code executes. Then finally we have our uh, and of try catch. I, I think that would be if no exceptions are caught or, 
or if, if an exception is thrown and not caught. I, I'm not really sure what the finally does, to be honest with you. I usually omit it, but whatever. Or I, I have omitted it in the past. All right, let's run this and see exactly what happens. So I compiled it. All right. I guess the end part happens uh, happens um, every time the try is tried, whether there's an error or not. That way, if you had any cleanup you had to do, you could put the code in there. But notice what happened. The first one was able to handle, so it did the squaring of three and got nine. Hits the end of try catch. This one is gets this error message, handle this one differently, end of try catch. So again, that end of try catch gets displayed every time this try gets tried, whether there's an exception or not. And if it was a class exception, we get this error message printed, handle this one differently. Let's go in and add our null object in there, and we'll see if we understand what happens. I'm going to go put an extra print line here, just to make it maybe a little bit easier to read. All right, first time the try catch gets executed, we have a legal thing in there. We have, a, we have an integer in there. We try to square the integer, and it works. We get a three. Yay. All right, so it displays it squared. It then hits the finally block. So remember, this finally block gets called regardless of if there's an error or not. So if the try completes successfully, or an exception is caught, either way, it's going to do this finally block. No. No, it doesn't have to have a finally. That would be like if you wanted to clear something up or, or something like that. Um, let's, say, let's say you're keeping track of how many things that you processed. All right? So you had a counter and you set the counter equal to zero initially. And you wouldn't want to increment the counter maybe at the, within the try because what if it got an error before it hit that counter? Uh, and I guess you could increment, well, yeah, where do you increment it then? If you put it in the finally then, it'll get caught every time. So that would be like something that maybe you would put in the finally, uh, a simple example. All right, the first exception was trying to handle a string like it was an integer, and that was a class cast exception, specifically. So, what do we do in that case? We catch it with this code. So, this code catches these exceptions. In other words, if an error occurs, if an error is thrown, if an exception is thrown by any of these statements, and it happens to be a class cast exception, we are going to execute this statement. Now, what does this mean? This means that the details of the exception gets put in a class, class cast exception object named E. And we can use that object to tell details about, like, specifically what went wrong. All right, because there's attributes. This, this exception objects are like any objects. They have attributes. And so we can use that. And in this case, we're displaying the get message function of that E object. 
and again, this is sort of a goofy example, but this shows how we can handle one exception one way and another exception another way. So, what if it's not an exception, a class cast exception? Well, then it falls under this guy. This guy is looking for any exception. Exceptions are classes just like anything else. And exceptions have an inheritance scheme just like everything else. And we're going to look for the more specific exceptions. And then we're going to look for the less ex uh, specific exceptions. So we're going to draw an inheritance diagram for this. Exception is our superclass. Inherited from that are our class cast exception our null pointer exception and a whole bunch of other exceptions you know, dozens of other exceptions our first catch looked for these kinds of errors and if this error occurs, we get this error message because it caught that kind of exception. Let's find out. I switched the order. So if the order matters, now I should get the generic error message both times. Ah, it, it matters. All right. In other words, it's telling me, hey, you've already caught every exception here. Don't bother looking for class cast exceptions. So think of this as being like, um, sieves of progressively smaller meshing. All right? In other words, if it catches, like if I had a series of sieves here, if I poured liquid that had some exceptions in it, all right, the ones that got caught by the first sieve aren't going to make it through the second sieve. The only ones that make it through the second sieve are the ones that didn't make it through, the, the, are the ones that made it. The only ones that make it to the second sieve are the ones that weren't caught by the first sieve. So, yeah, that's why in general you write these, you write the most uh, specific exceptions on top to filter those out, and then you capture the more generic um, exceptions going down. Um, I was surprised it gave me a compile error, but. I guess that's good, right? Generally speaking, if there's something wrong with your code, you want a compiler to be, to be caught, to catch it, right? Because then you know about it and you can fix it. Whereas a runtime error, you don't know until some special circumstances arise and you get that error. Now again, any exception that wasn't a class cast exception would get caught by this. So in this hypothetical situation, we, oh, we care most about those class cast exceptions. We want to identify those. Every other exception we're treating the same way. That one we're treating in a special way. All right. I have one more example. I don't remember what this one is, but we'll find out in a minute. Excuse me.
Oh, this is a good one. All right, that's a good sign. In this example, I've taken it one step further, and I have written my own exceptions. I expect a Kool-Aid man to come bursting through any minute here. All right, let's look at Let's look at the two main classes here. I have a test class and I have a driver's permit class. What this is doing is this is testing to see if a person is eligible to get a driver's license or not. All right. What are the rules to get a driver's license in my hypothetical state? All right. The rules are, and there's a lot of code in here, most of it's exception handling. And that's not uncommon, by the way that your checks to make sure your data is valid may outweigh your actual programming logic. Okay. Here's the rules that you get your driver's license. Passed the eye test. I guess this is for a temporary, not a driver's license which actually makes this a touching example because if I'm not mistaken I wrote this uh, I use this example like when my daughter was just getting her temps my younger daughter which and she's 20 now so this is like probably five year old code that I wrote all right but it still works so past eye tests over 15 and a half and you get 75 or greater than uh, on the test if those three conditions are met, then yes, you've passed. So all three conditions have to be true. Otherwise, you don't get your temporary permit. Now, what are the things that could go wrong with this? Well, there's a bunch of things that could go wrong with this, right? And I tested for a few of them. Things that could go wrong with this. I could give a ridiculous age. Specifically, what would be defined as a ridiculous age? You know, an age of negative one. So a negative number for an age would be a ridiculous age. Anything else I'm not sure I want to test for, right? It's possible that there could be an older person that's getting their temp for the first time. So. That's the only thing I checked for. You know, we could argue whether I needed to check for more or not, but that's not the point. Test score. What should the test score be? Well, presumably between 0 and 100. So if it's outside of that range, it's also a problem. All right? If it's outside of the range of 0 to 100, it's also a problem. All right? So, these are different kinds of exceptions than the exceptions we looked before. The exceptions we looked at before are simply Java language exceptions. Doesn't matter what you're doing, right? You can't take a string and turn it into an integer. You just can't. 
In other applications, maybe 120 is a valid value for a score on a test. You know, the SAT, the scores are in the hundreds. So I couldn't necessarily say that an integer has to always between, be between 0 and 100. All right? These are more application-specific exceptions all right, that we can throw. And again, we can throw these to whatever level, layer of granularity we're interested in. So we can throw very specific errors, or we can throw more general errors. Let's look at the code and see what errors we're throwing. First of all, notice this. We're throwing, we, we've added something to the function decla declaration. Part, some added something to the signature. And that's a list of the exceptions that get thrown. So we're saying this function throws a driver permit age low exception or a driver permit score exception. It throws either a driver permit age low exception or a driver permit score exception. Now these are classes I made. All right? I made them. But I have to tell this function has to say that it might throw these exceptions. Now here's the rule. If you throw an exception, something has to catch it. All right? Um and again, if you don't catch it, um, the Java runtime will catch it. So, what does my code look like here? I have a method that says is eligible. I pass it an age, a Boolean on the I test, and a score. I look at the value of the age, and if the value of the age is less than zero, I throw the driver permit low exception. And I throw that exception, throw new, looks like I'm calling a constructor, and what this is doing is this is initializing an error message saying that negative one is too low of an age or something like that to be a valid age. Likewise, I look to see if the score is greater than 100. I guess I'm an optimist and, and think no one's going to get a negative score on this. All right? um, but I could have uh, if it's greater than 100 or less than 0. I probably should, because right? a negative value isn't correct here either. If it is greater than 100, though, I throw a new driver's permit score exception. So if either of these two cases occur, the function exits here. It throws its, its exception and it's out of there. It can't, if you throw an exception, you can't go on processing it. So the exception that it throws will get thrown back to whoever called it, and whoever called it better catch it. All right? If it makes it through there, then it checks to see, did they pass the eye test? Is their age over 15 and a half? Is their score over 75? If that's true, then the results are true, otherwise the results are false, and we return that. Now let's look at the code that calls this. I have a try, and I'm calling this method, and I'm testing if this returns a true, then they're eligible, otherwise they're not eligible. But it's part of a try catch block, which means that it's going to execute this, if this throws any exceptions, the exceptions are coming back to this function, right? By saying this guy throws the exception, it, it's kind of like playing hot potato. The exception happens, yeah, I don't want it, boom, throws it to someone else to handle it. Well, in our case, who has to handle it is who called the function. So the calling function has to, the calling, uh, uh, the calling uh, code, that calls this function might get thrown one of those exceptions. It needs to deal with it. And in this case, it needs to deal with it. It looks to see if, and again, in this case, I'm testing the driver's permit age exception. 
and I'm displaying two different error messages and one says I know there is a driver's permit age exception. The other thing I'm doing is I'm catching E which is a generic exception. So any other exception that that throws will get handled by this. Now in this case where I say that uh, the age is negative 16 and the score is 178, if we run this I already did this. Tester. I know there is a driver's permit age exception. Now notice it didn't show the other problem, because there's another problem too, right, that the score was too high. But this code, the if statement to check for age was first. So it caught that, it detected that exception and threw it before it had a chance to execute this code. So if I go and change this to 16 years old, then I don't get the age exception, I get the other exception. Now, I don't have any code specific to that kind of exception, but it gets caught by this anyhow. All right? What we're going to do next time uh, is we're going to play through some more scenarios with this before we start with the user interface. But just to kind of close the loop here, we should take a minute looking at these exceptions. I've actually created, well we'll do that next time. Let's look at one of these classes. Driver's permit ex age exception extends driver's permit exception. So I've created a set of exceptions for driver's permit. And one of them is an age exception. And one of them is an age too low exception. Take a look at these between now and Monday. Um, these uh, allow you to define your own exceptions. In a nutshell, what you do is you extend the built-in Java class for exception. Driver permit exception extends exception. And then I have different subclasses that do different things. And the reason for that is by having more exceptions, I can test and do things differently um, depending on exactly what went wrong. I don't have to do this. I could always just throw an exception. But if I throw an exception, then I'm limited to being able to differentiate between exactly what went wrong, and therefore my reaction I'm not able to differentiate and, and handle different uh, actions based on different errors. All right. Any questions? We'll pick up on this example on Monday and we'll start getting into user interfaces. All right, we'll see you then.